Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Breakwater, or as Pastor Kirk likes to say, the BMEC, Breakwater Mega Embassy Church. <laughs> we are small but mighty. So welcome today for those of you here and, and online. Uh, it's a great day today, so we'll uh, go ahead and get started. I'd like to read a quick verse for you uh, out of Psalms. Psalms 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the people that are here, our family. We thank you for those online. Father, we pray a blessing over everyone here and those online, and we just pray that you just guide us and keep showing us the path that you want us to lead and live. And we look forward to hearing Pastor Kurt's message today, that we put it into our daily lives. So we just thank you for him and all that he does. And we thank you for this church. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, good morning, everyone. Stand if you can. Let's worship the Lord. Happy Sunday. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever, with mighty hands and outstretched arms. of God, we will carry on, His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, forever. forever.
bless the Lord of oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, seem like never. Worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. You're excuse me, thank you, Lord. You are living Lord. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, we invite you.
Jesus, thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for your presence. You're with us right now. And we're just so thankful, Lord, for the sacrifice you made so that we can live free and be with you, Lord. And we just pray that we are able to accept this message with our full hearts. And thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, awesome worship trio. Who wants to praise the Lord today? Anybody? Woo! I know. Good to have Marvin back in town. Been a long time seeing him. Hannah, everybody else. Paula, Anna, Diane, and this little one up front, right? <laughs> All you guys, it's great, it's great to be here. I feel like I've been gone for so long, but it just feels good to be back myself in country and to be able to praise the Lord. So this week is my 35-year anniversary of ministry, uh, vocational ministry, certified uh, ordained minister of Foursquare. Yeah, so 35 years ago, I uh, walked into the doors of Hope Chapel 
was so funny because I, I went there. It was like 7.30 in the morning thinking, you know, I guess that's what you do because I've been in aerospace. So you just get there at 6.30, right? So I thought I'd sleep in a little bit. So I, I get there and the doors are locked. I go, what, what time do they go to? What time do they work here? I just don't even know how it worked. <laughs> and so they put me in charge of everything in the entire church. <clears throat> so I had a Wednesday night roots class and then we had church on Friday night, right? And Saturday night church and three services on Sunday. And then we had a staff meeting on Wednesday morning really early. So if I went to Wednesday, I'd get home really late and I wouldn't see my kids in the morning because I had to go there early. So it'd be like two days I didn't see the kids. And then, uh, you know, it's Friday night and then it's Saturday night. So it's a lot of night work. And so I had to adjust my whole schedule. And I realized that my kids go to school during the day when I would kind of be home a little bit and then they'll be home at night, but I'll be gone most nights. So I figured well, we got to do something different here. So that's when uh, we started homeschooling, which worked out really great for us because we could all be home at the same time. I could spend time with my kids and raise my own children rather than having somebody else raise them. So I'm pretty excited about all that. So why? The big question Jesus asked. Why should we build our house on a rock? I mean, what's going on in the world right now is crazy, wouldn't you say? What's going on in America in particular, you know, we consider ourselves to be like this bastion of freedom and peace and justice and we see it all unraveling before our eyes. We see riots and carjackings are up and murders up and crimes up and burnings and injustice and corruption and raids and you know, it's like, what's, what's going on here? You got the Afghan debacle and you got Ukraine and so the world is just, uh, the COVID, you know, it's just, it's nonsense, isn't it? It's crazy, absolutely chaos. And so what we get to see is evil and, uh, and corruption being exposed. We get to see the great face of that. These are troublesome times. Turn this thing on. <clears throat> I got my little, where'd that little pointer go? There it is. Got to get this going. There we are. Let's see. Why? Okay, big question. The good thing about knowing the Lord is that we know he holds the future. What do you say? Amen. And the funny thing about it is we're singing these old songs from the Psalms and thousands of years ago, and we started out with Psalm 1, and, you know, the love of God endures forever, and we're the evidence that that's true, isn't it? I mean, the love of God endures to all generations, which is why we're here today. I wouldn't be here if this was the Rotary Club. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so even 3,000 years ago when this little proverb was written, the book of Proverbs, Old Testament, when the storm is swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Now, storm is a metaphor, of course, Right? It's describing the difficulties and the troubles and confusions of life. So what's going on right now is not new. <laughs> it's new to us in a certain degree because it's been exposed so right, right in front of us so much. And because we're seeing it just every day. So this, the, the chaos that's happening right now, the storm, it's like a, it's a storm. It's, it's wind. It's, it's sweeping. And what's happening is it's cleaning up the wicked. The wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. That's a great promise, isn't it? So while we are looking at the storm, we should be thinking, what should I be doing to protect myself from this storm, right? If you live in a Florida in some hurricane place, when they say, hey, this, this hurricane's coming in, what do you do? You batten down, you put the window things on, you protect yourself, right? So we should be paying attention to what's going on, not just horrified by it, but also motivated by that to make sure that we have a firm foundation with Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to last. Check it out. The righteous stand firm forever. So we should want to know what righteousness is so that we can stand in that and make sure that we endure whatever the world happens to throw at us. So we want to know that we're not trusting in chariots and horses, which means armies and governments and, you know, outside influences and, you know, the world to 
protect us or to help us. The Lord saves his anointed. Okay? If you're born again by the Holy Spirit, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, God has anointed your life. All right? God has given you a ministry and a work to do and a destiny and a purpose. He's carved you out of darkness and translated you into his marvelous light to show forth his glorious deeds. Are you there? What an incredible privilege that is. So you can't look at and go, oh, that guy on TV, he's the anointed one. No, if you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you are anointed. And the Lord saves his anointed. <clears throat> not only from, <clears throat> from uh, the ultimate misery of hell, but he also saves you for a good purpose, which we'll talk about. So we're going to remember the name of the Lord, our God. Uh, they've bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. So when others have fallen, we're able to rise. Can you imagine? When everything is collapsing, everything's falling, we're able to rise because of God in our life. We stand upright. So, there's a big why question. And we want to look at how to build our lives wisely on the Lord. Jesus has some core teachings, some core values. Kingdom of God in Luke chapter 6. If you've got a Bob, you can turn there. Try and scroll through it up here. But when he started this section, which is called the Sermon on the Plain. Now, we got the Sermon on the Mount. We know that one. Uh, now, every, every preacher knows that you don't preach one sermon one time, right? If you're, if you're an itinerant preacher, you can preach the same sermon in different locations. If it's any good for here, it's good for there. If it's good for there, it's good for here, right? So I would imagine that Jesus taught the same principles of the Sermon on the Mount over and over again in his many years of ministry to different groups of people at different times. So we have this one, which is called Sermon on the Plain. And he says, I'm going to tell you who is the wise builder and what you got to do to make sure that you're a part of that group of people that can stand through the storm and the difficult times ahead. So he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me, that's number one, right? Come to the Lord. Are you with me? So Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. I will give you peace in your soul. So we come to Jesus and then what? Hear my words, hear my sayings. And then third, do them. All right? Come to Jesus, hear what Jesus has to say, do what Jesus tells us. And that's like the person who builds their house and lays a deep, deep foundation on the rock. That's what should be happening right now in our lives. This should not be a time for complacency or fear. It should be a time for building and building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So that when this flood comes, when the storms come and beats against that house, you couldn't shake it because it's founded on the rock. Come on. Who wants to be that person? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. And then there's the other person who maybe came, maybe came to Jesus. He had to hear, so you've got to be close enough to hear, right? But did nothing. And what do we know about do-nothing faith? Hmm? It's useless. useless. He heard, did nothing. Built a house without a foundation. Stream, storm beat. It fell, ruined. It was great. <sighs> Don't let that be you, right? Who wants that? Nobody. So Jesus outlines the blueprint for the, the master plan for the wise builder, and he gives four values, four kingdom of God building material. He says, this is what I'm telling you. Now listen to me, right? I'm telling you, if you can hear me, love your enemies. How easy is that? That's impossible, <laughs> right? That's why he said that. He could have said, love your wife, love your pastor, love your kids. 
That's easy to do, usually. Okay? But that's hard enough, isn't it? So loving your enemies is virtually an impossible thing to do. That needs the love of God. And that's the highest possible bar and mountain peak you could find. What do you say? So he's taking away every excuse to not love by calling us to love the absolute unlovable. Do good to those who hate you. Are you kidding me? That's the opposite of everything we want to do to those who hate us. Sometimes I remember our own family get mad at them all the time, right? Sometimes we don't want to go to Christmas with our family because they're all crazy. Not my family, though. <laughs> do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I mean, if somebody flips you off, do you want to bless those people? If someone cuts you off in traffic, do you want to bless those people? Yeah, I'll bless you. <laughs> so these are building materials for a wise life. This is what righteousness looks like. This is what an anointed person should be pursuing. So what does it take to be a wise builder? What does it take to be building your house on a good foundation. There's four things. This is all you have to know for the rest of your life. You don't need to go to Bible college anymore. You don't need to read any commentaries anymore. You just concentrate on these four things. You'll be good. Are you with me? Okay. You don't need a PhD to do this. You don't need libraries full of Greek lexicons in order to do these things. In fact, there should be a school that you go to where they teach you this. Oh, that would be here. So these four actions are outlined by the Lord Jesus. These are kingdom of God values. They're the essential building blocks that produce the lasting house of wisdom. These are the brick and mortar that you build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now think about this, and this is important, that Jesus had a way of simplifying things, didn't he? Hmm? Remember when they asked him the big question, what's the greatest commandment? And they've got, you know, a library full of law books. He goes, those two things, <laughs> right? What? Love God, love people. Can you imagine? How amazing is that? <laughs> Think of all the, the laws and the regulations they have just concerning Sabbath. I got a book up there in my office, Talmud, 1,000 pages on just what you got to do to observe the Sabbath correctly. And Jesus says, no, no, hold, hold on, prophets, those two things. And he makes theology and serving God practical, all right? We make serving God so complicated. We make theology so difficult, so mystical, so intellectual. We want to get out the Greek lexicons and make sure we know all the words and all the commentaries. And then we want to debate every last little part of every little word that Jesus said so that the Bible becomes so complicated we don't do anything. But Jesus says, look it, just do these four things, right? Just do these four. Love, do good, bless, and pray. So what's, what's the measure of success in the kingdom of God? I mean, do you want to do God's will, right? Is it having a big giant church with all kinds of programs? Or is it people who join together to try to walk before the Lord in kingdom principles. And what did we learn from Jesus the other day in Matthew 6.33? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All these things will be added to you. The things that Gentiles work for, slave over, kill for. Jesus said, I will take care of that. I know what you need. Right? Seek righteousness. Now, if we think about these four things that Jesus gives us as followers of here, on uh, this core values, what's, what's missing here? Hmm? Everything. Everything else that we come to think of as religion. All the isms. Catholicism, Protestantism, Calvinism, atheism, hedonism, Marxism, naturalism, socialism, racism, sexism, culturalism. So all the isms are gone. Can you imagine? Let's face it. What's the culture doing? Culture's following horses and chariots. And they're on a downhill slide for a long time. Is this anything new that we see happening in the country? 
in the world? Absolutely not. So these are character attributes. What is God concerned about? The building you go to or the building that you are? We are, we are the temple. God is more concerned about the interior of you than the exterior of you. What do you say? What do you say to the Pharisees? You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're like graves painted white. Oh, look good. Do all the religious things. Go all, keep all the religious festivals. Say all the religious prayers. Got the hair right. Got the hat right. Got the clothes right. Got everything correct. What do you say? No. Inside, you're full of corruption and evil. So let's face it. Jesus is more concerned about these character issues that flow out of the heart than he is anything that has to do with religion. This, this is righteousness. Okay? Righteousness is not religion. Can we agree on that? Look at this. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bring forth good things. Where's that treasure? It's inside the person. You bring it out. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So then Jesus asked this very important question, is why do you not do the things which I say? All right? This is one of the biggest questions in the world that needs to be answered. Why do you not do what I say? Jesus asked why. So... Why humans do what they do is a huge question, is it not? And people try to answer that. Freud tries to answer it. Carl Jung, Maslow, Rogers, Dr. Dobson, Thomas Aquinas, Plato. They all try to sort through and figure out why humans do what they do. And they make their contributions. Skinner has a way. Psychology has a way. The world has a way. Politicians have a way. We have our own way. There's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is with death. Devil has a way. And Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. And Jesus teaches his students how to be wise builder, how to rise when everything else is falling around you. And these are timeless words for every generation. Aren't you glad about that? We're not looking back at some myth. We're not looking back at something that hasn't proven itself to be true. We know that these words are absolutely 100% true. Now, everybody also knows that we have a global problem with evil. Anybody not know that? (laughs) The problem with evil out there is it begins from evil in here. That's the real problem that we have to deal with. And the question is, Jesus asks is, why do you do that? So where does he put the responsibility for that action? He puts it on the individual. Why do you not do what I tell you to do? And a part of that is not that he doesn't know the answer, because he knows the answer quite well, but he wants us to reflect on why we do what we do and to grade it against the four core, love, do good, bless, and pray. Is it love? Is it good? Is it a blessing? Is it something we should be praying about? Now, the reason that we don't do what Jesus tells us to do is because we can. It's volitional, is it not? Now, think about Jesus saying, this is what I want you to do. Now, who's Jesus? Son of God, God incarnate, God come in human flesh. And he goes, listen to me, do what I tell you to do. But he says, but you won't do that. That's a problem. All right? And the reason we don't do what he says is because we can. Right? We have the will and ability to disobey God, just like Adam and Eve. Right? We always like to be mad at them when we're not much better than that. So, now you think about Calling him Lord, which means you understand something about who Jesus claims to be or that he has got some kind of authority in your life, right? Why do you call me Lord and then not do what I say? And then you can study the times and you realize that the political leadership there, the religious leadership, completely 
corrupt. These are the ones that crucified Jesus unjustly, railroaded his kangaroo court, rammed it through, seized him, killed him. Do you think that's moral? No. So the most religious people in the world crucified Jesus Christ. So think about all that religion. Religion is not a cover-up for immorality. What do you think? Now, do you think that pedophilia is wrong? There's a huge problem in the church right now. There's a crisis in the church of pedophilia right now, in the larger church. What do you say? Anybody, anybody aware of that? Yeah, it's huge. Think about it. Do you think that religious clothes, religious position, endless religious activities will make up for the pedophilia disaster in the church? Will it cover it up? Will, uh, will, uh, will a black robe and a little white uh, collar cover that up or condone that? No, it doesn't matter how many prayers you pray or how many masses, church, or synagogue services you go to. Pedophilia is moral depravity. And pedophilia has nothing in common with Jesus Christ. Do you think Jesus would condone pedophilia? Do you think Jesus uh, would encourage that and approve of that? No, it's demonic. Amen. And if it doesn't look like Jesus, it's not Christian. Can we agree on that? Think about it. Now, do you think Jesus would approve of lying, hmm? cheating, defrauding, corruption? Do you think that Jesus would approve of sexual slavery, child abuse? What would he say? Don't do that. And then what would he say? Why do you not do what I tell you? There's a breakdown. Do you see that? Jesus doesn't want that. It's not God's will. But why does it happen? He goes, why do you do that? We have a nature that's dark. There's a part of each person that needs to be set free and conquered and disciplined. You can't cast it out. It needs to be disciplined. Are you with me? You can go to a thousand prayer meetings, but the old man is still there. That's why we're supposed to put on the new man clothed in righteousness, which is a physical act, a spiritual act of being mindful of what we're doing every day. Do you think Jesus would approve of murder, oppression, human sacrifice, abortion? Do you think Jesus would approve of jealousy, anger, or selfishness? No. So it doesn't matter if you wear a white frock with a red dress and frilly coats and big hats and carry sticks around and march around and sit on thrones and do all kinds of things. It doesn't matter if you got a PhD from an evangelical seminary. None of that would be approved by Jesus. None of that is Christian. Not according to Jesus anyway. So it's not hard to tell the difference between the wise builder and the wicked builder and it has nothing to do with your religious activities. It has to do with love, do good, bless, and pray. Jesus said, wisdom is shown to be right by its results. In other words, you can see what wisdom is by looking at the outcome of it, right? So it's not hard for us to tell the difference between the divine and the demonic. Now, Jesus came from a big family. One of his half-brothers wrote this. If you, what's if you mean? That's a condition, which means maybe you, maybe not. That's an if, right? If is the biggest word in the Bible. If you are wise and you understand God's ways, then prove it or show it or authenticate that. By what? Honor, doing good works, Humility that comes from wisdom. All right? But if you, now here's the other person, right? We are both of these people. Okay? We can focus on what God's ways and walk in that, because that Jesus wants us to do, right? We need to understand that we don't always walk in God's way. We don't always do it perfectly. Humility means we can admit when we're wrong. We can apologize and make things right and fix it, right? 
we all understand that we've got this problem, this chain that we're carrying around. There's not a person in the world that hasn't put their foot in the mouth any number of times and swallowed the whole thing, right? How many times you got to eat the pie? So if you are jealous and there's selfish ambition where? In your heart, don't cover that up with boasting and lying. So religion can't cover that up. Going to church can't cover that up. Going, doing all kinds of religious activities and sacrifices and prayers and books and travel. None of that can cover it up. The only thing that can cover that up is the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? You need to bring it to the cross of Jesus, confess it as sin, and get it cleaned up. Why? Because jealousy and selfishness are not God's wisdom. It's not God's way. It's not God's way of doing things. These things are unspiritual and demonic. How can we tell if things are demonic? If they look like selfishness and anger and jealousy and bitterness, it is actually demonic. And you can get help with that, right? Satan will help you hook into that and give you reasons why you have every right to that, okay? instead of rejecting it and coming to Jesus Christ. So where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, what else happens? It's a downward spiral. It's more and more dysfunction, more and more disorder, and the growth of evil. So a part of the reasons why we do bad things is due to the demonic. And we, we know that in every culture universally, since the dawn of human history, Every culture believes in the supernatural world, and the supernatural world isn't always a good place, right? Been all over India, all over Africa, China, many different places where there's multiple gods and multiple deities, and it's not a good thing. And we also understand by this time that we have an inner enemy, right? We have an outer one and an inner one that needs to be Controlled. So the reason we have the Holy Spirit is give us the fruit of self-control to say no, right, to the flesh of Sark's sinful nature, the help of the Holy Spirit, so that we can walk in the, right, the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So no amount of religious practices will cover over our bad or immoral cho choices. Okay, so now. Here's what wisdom looks like. Here's what God wants. Here's God's will. Wisdom is pure. Pure in its purest form. Can you imagine how awesome that is? Peace loving. <laughs> Gentle. Willing to yield. Merciful. The fruit of good deeds. It's without hypocrisy. It's sincere. Peacemakers plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of what? Righteousness, which is the foundation that you build your house on so that you can endure the coming storms. All right? Those are building materials. That's what it looks like. That's what God wants. Now, check it out. Do you see anything in here about going to church or reading books and, and, and uh, you know, doing all kinds of religious stuff? making journeys, wearing special religious clothes, or doing religious things on a particular day. Please stand up and repeat after me. Kneel down when I tell you to kneel down. Come to church when I tell you to come to church. Do you see any of that here? No, you do not. These are the things that are most important to God, and you can go to church your whole life and not know Jesus Christ. I did. I was raised in a Christian home. I went to church every single Sunday. It's a mortal sin if I didn't, right? So I had to go. And it was like, I don't know Jesus, so what? Graduated from high school, I just quit going to church altogether. It was just nonsense. It was just like a mythology to me. So my whole idea of Christianity was just, was just a ridiculous waste of time. It's only until I found out that you could actually have Jesus in your life. You could have your sins forgiven. You could pray to receive. You could come to Jesus, right? You could hear Jesus and follow Jesus. That it was a lot, had a life-changing impact on me. So... I don't know, 1974 for that, but this is 1987 being here, trying to serve the Lord uh, any way we possibly can. 
All right? So please understand what's missing here in this list is a lot of stuff that everybody considers to be true religion. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So it's important that we understand that this thing is much simpler than we think, but much harder than it is. It's easier for me to, to go to a church and kneel and stand up when you tell me and do all the stuff you tell me than it is to change my heart. All right? I might be able to do every religious thing you tell me. Like Paul says, I was blameless. <laughs> but then when his eyes are open, what do he say? I'm a chief of sinners. Right? <laughs> How'd you go from blameless in religion, religious practice, and religious duty to becoming the chief sinner? Because he realized it was the inside that God was concerned about, not all the do's and don'ts and the long list of religious practices. Whew. Now, in theology, if you study this any length of time, there's a number of reasons why we do things. And in certain theological circles, the why we do things is always God's will. They say God's will means that God controls each and every decision, each and every person of each and every day. You everybody hear that? Now, you remember Flip Wilson? Anybody remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. Well, in certain Christian circles, the quote would be, God made me do it. All right? So check this one out, for instance. In the Reformation period, a number of theologies perked up. One was popularized by a guy named John. So he says this, and it's important that you see this, and it's, why don't you learn something, right? So he agrees with Augustine, who was a bishop in the 400s, straddled that particular period, North Africa. The Lord created those who, as he certainly knew, were to go to destruction, and he did so because he so willed it. Why he willed it is not ours to ask. Now, he says that God created people specifically for hell. And why he willed it is not ours to ask, and we can't comprehend it. We shouldn't even raise a controversy <laughs> as to justice. But if we question this, morbid theology, we're not questioning God, we're questioning John, which is just a person, a theologian in the Reformation, all right? He goes on to say this, God foresees things which are to happen simply because he's decreed them to happen. And it's vain to debate about uh, foreknowledge. It's clear that all events take place by his sovereign appointment. How many events? All events take place by his sovereign appointment. And then this is developed in other confessions as the Reformation takes place, 1500s, 1561. God, after he created all things, did not give them up to chance, but he rules and governs them according to his holy will so that nothing happens in this world without his appointment. What does that mean? Nothing happens in this world without his appointment, making it happen. He orders, he executes, he works in a most excellent and just manner, even when devils and wicked men act unjustly. Nothing can befall us by chance, but by the direction of our most gracious and heavenly Father. All right? Nothing happens in the world without his appointment. Even devils and wicked men act unjustly. I want to see it again from the Heidelberg Confession. What does providence mean? What does sovereignty mean? Okay, here's the answer. God, the Almighty, God, by his hand, upholds and governs heaven and earth and what? All creatures. Rain, drought, barren years, health, sickness, poverty, all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Want to see another one? Westminster Confession of Faith. No more? <laughs> Can I remember this? Yeah, this is the last one. God, the great creator of all things. Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646. Creator of all things. Does uphold, direct, dispose, govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least. How much? All 
from greatest to the least. By his providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge and his free and immutable counsel, immutable means unchanging, of his own will, to the praise of his glory. All right, so what do we learn here? Some people think the why we do things is because God has appointed you to do that. Okay? He upholds, he governs, he appoints all things in heaven and earth by his unchangeable will. Nothing happens by chance. Even devils and wicked men act by the direction of the heavenly father. Drought, barren years, sickness, poverty comes from his fatherly hand. We shouldn't question that. God foresees all things because he's decreed all things. He's created, decreed endless multitudes expressly for the torment of eternal hell. Why he will that, it's not ours to ask. But we do anyway. And it's important in the point that I'm going to get to at some point today. So, <clears throat> if God sent the storm on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus prayed to calm the storm, is Jesus contradicting God's will? If God sends drought and sickness, is it wrong for us to pray for rain and healing? <laughs> Anybody pray for rain for California? Yeah. All the time. And if God sends wicked officials and puts them into position, is it wrong for us to vote against them? And if God sends famine, is it wrong for us to get food from another country? And if God sends the devil... To possess people, is it wrong for us to pray for deliverance? And if it's God's will for me to forgive, shouldn't I automatically forgive? <laughs> Why is it such a struggle to forgive people? Now, Jesus said this, there's two outcomes to your decisions in life. He says, why don't you do what I tell you? The outcome of doing what I tell you is good. The outcome of not doing what I tell you is ruin. Why don't you do what I tell you? The house stands or the house falls based upon the choices we make about the word of God. And he urges people to make the wise decision. He, may, he urges his followers to make the best decision. Now, in ancient Christianity, from the beginning, study church history, God has given us his image to make choices that are full of positive and negative ramifications. It's the same all the way through. You look at the Old Testament, you look at the law. He says, choose, choose this day whom you will serve. You follow me, I'll bless you. Go, go on and come in, right? If you don't, there's other ramifications of that. So obviously, we've all experienced the negative ramifications of bad choices and bad decisions and bad words and things that we've done, right? It's painful sometimes. But the unanimous view of the apostles in the early church is that we have freedom to choose between good and evil. I mean, think about it. If God makes all my choices for me, why do I make so many bad choices? Right? I would love for God to make all my choices for me. <laughs> Then I could, I could do no wrong, right? So when I was a kid, my mom had irresistible sovereign power over my meals. I was forced to eat liver every Thursday. All right, what can you do? But when I became an adult, guess what? Never ate liver again. Ain't going to happen. Which is what? Did God choose me to eat liver when I was a kid because my mom forced me or does God want me free from liver because now I'm an adult and I don't have to eat it anymore? Did God change his mind on nutrition? <sighs> All this to say we can do a much better job. Amen. We can do a much better job. He calls us to build our, our house on wisdom, right? By wisdom a house is built. By understanding is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant goods. He also says, wisdom builds her house, but foolishness with her own hands tears it down. We have choices to make. Why do you not do what I tell you? Why do you not do? Jesus said that. Now, we know that we're supposed to love our enemies there's no irresistible power that forces us to make choices for 
good or bad, right? Hopefully you came today under your own volition, got in your car, you said, yeah, I'm going to church today. <sighs> so there's libraries filled with books, all about controversial issues of free will, and all kinds of things about, we argue about predestination, we argue about religion and politics and law and nature and fashion and food and medicines, we argue about surfboards. And in religion, there's a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of compulsion that's unnecessary and void of any real impact on your life or the future. All right? For instance, he says, this is the way it's going to look in this time, perilous times. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unloving, unholy, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, <clears throat> lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away. All right? <sighs> Look at that list. I mean, anybody could look at that list and go, yeah, that is not God's will, right? But still so many people live like this. We want to make sure that not only do we turn away from such people, that we ourselves are monitoring our inner geography to avoid that. And Jesus says, keep it pure, keep it simple. Four things, love, do good, bless, and pray. All in favor? What does that take? It takes commitment. It takes some work. What, you know, build. What's, you build anything. Does it happen by itself? You plant anything. Does it happen by itself? I bought all kinds of seeds this year with all good intention to plant them. But guess what? God didn't plant them for me. And so I have no garden except for the one tomato plant that mysteriously grew all by itself. So beautiful. <sighs> Last one. This is it. Promise. Just the top one. Love is patient. No one's perfectly patient. What do you say? It's a, it's a hard road, but we, we have to hear God. We have to care about what Jesus says to us. We have to chart our course by these coordinates. We have to bow down in humility to love. What do you say? It's a summation of all things. We cannot keep records of wrongs. It's so hard not to do that, isn't it? We have to go through those records. We have to forgive every single person that needs to be forgiven in your life, whether they respond to it or not. What do you say? It's not easily angered, doesn't boast, it's not self-seeking. Love doesn't delight in evil, protects, hopes, persevere. Love never fails. Again, what is missing here? Everything that we come to believe as traditional religion and religious practice. And what does Paul say? Without love, it's all <laughs> goose egg, right? All of it, all of it. Not one part of it is worth anything without love. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much. Lord, you put us on a journey. We see the map. We see the summit. We just pray, God, that somehow, some way, that we would do hear and do, come to you, hear what you say, do what you say. I pray, Father, even now as we look forward to the last few months of this year, that it would be a productive year, that we could love each other, that we could work hard together, that we can make good things happen in our world because of the good things that you've done in our lives. I pray, Father, that as we struggle forward and struggle to grow, 
that we would produce much fruit that honors you. And God, I just ask that your blessing would be upon us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Should we worship the Lord together?
they wept The morning sun was dead The Savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him Final breath Son of God was laid in darkness, a battle in the grave, a war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broke. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be over.
thank you, Jesus, for your promises. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful, God. Thank you that you are forever alive. You're forever with us, Lord, through the good and the bad. And we can always count on you. You love us and you care for us, Lord. And we're just, uh, we want to be in love with you, Lord. Help us to reach out to you during the hard and the good times, Lord. And uh, we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.